Uh, it's now a, a pleasure for me to introduce a um, friend and colleague from uh, the Camden uh, campus of uh, Rutgers University, a member of the chemistry department, Dr. Guillaume Lamoureux. Guillaume, the floor is Thank yours. You. Your slides All are right. visible. Good. Okay. Um, so, so I, I will not present uh, applications of Alpha Fold or Rosetta Fold. I will just um, describe briefly what our lab has been up to last last few years and uh, in what direction we're heading. Um, I want to uh, discuss the uh, the question of uh, learning protein structure from something other than sequence or multiple sequence alignments and structure itself. Uh, so can we learn protein structure from function is, uh, is what I'm talking about. So I'll be presenting uh, the work of uh, Dr. Georgi Dervianko, uh, who was in the lab for some years and a grad student in the lab also, Sid. Um, so so just to, to summarize at a very high level um, what's happening in, in the field now uh, is that uh, there are those new um, uh, machine learning models um, that model structure or learn to predict structure from sequence or multiple sequence alignments. Um, and uh, they typically train uh, to some extent on, uh, on structural data. So PDB is a critical resource for all these models. Um, so the arrow here represents uh, a neural network, for instance, a deep neural network that can be trained through uh, back propagation of, a, of an error function. Uh, so that all the parameters inside that network get optimized. Um, now, um, another powerful technique, very powerful actually, which is also used uh, to a large extent by uh, AlphaFold and Rosetta Fold, is learning from sequence data alone. So, uh, and I'm I'm talking about learning structures. The idea here is um, that uh, you don't learn directly um, to predict structure, you learn an intermediate representation, what's sometimes called a sequence embedding um, in the field, um, uh, that uh, you learn simply by, by forcing a model to uh, essentially summarize or represent in a very compact and semantically rich way uh, the sequence data that you present that model. So the model learns uh, how to represent uh, in, in, in a very simple way, any kind of sequence of protein sequence you present to it. Uh, so, and then it's trained simply uh, on the task of getting a, a sequence and input, forming a representation of it, and then decoding that representation back into the exact same sequence. Okay, This can be done with multiple sequence alignments also. Um, now, this representation, um, somewhat surprisingly, but not completely unexpectedly, um, contains hidden inside uh, those numbers, uh, a lot of information about the structure. So, so there's that model uh, basically um, that you can build that uses that representation as an input and uh, that decodes uh, from that representation, any kind of structural information that you might want. So you end up doing a, indirectly a, a prediction about the structure starting from a, a sequence embedding. So, so this has been shown to work very well uh, in many cases. Uh, and it's also an important component of a, a model that's going to be successful. Uh, you could predict function the same way, actually. Um, so the, the question we're asking here is, um, is um, actually, could we also use functional data as a, a, a source of information to basically um, uh, get better at predicting structure, for instance. Um, it should be the case uh, because we know that structure determines function. Um, so, uh, so if you can back propagate some functional data and, uh, and find what's the underlying molecular structure here, it should actually help uh, in training. Um, so, so our early attempts at doing something like that, uh, we're not quite uh, it's a targeting a function, but we're just targeting a, uh, something that's more like an energy that will um, will simply tell you whether a protein uh, decoy or a, a a protein structure that's been predicted, let's say, by any kind of computational method, uh, is close to native state or far from native state. Um, so. Uh, uh, so we designed this uh, neural net and trained it um, to uh, take as input a, uh, a 3D representation of the, the proposed protein structure 
and uh, boiling down all that information, which is high resolution uh, in, in space. Um, so we're really describing the at atomic densities of the protein and boiling that down into uh, a score, which uh, we then interpret as um, some kind of energy. So the lower that score, the closer potentially uh, uh, that structure is to the, the actual native structure. Um, so the, the model is, uh, is fairly complicated, but um, it's based on, uh, on an architecture that's often used for image analysis. So essentially our input is uh, more or less like a pixelated version or a pixelated image of the protein, uh, which is broken down into multiple channels for different atom types. And then we process that, boil it down into a single number. Uh, which is our score. So, so um, this model uh, was was kind of our first attempt. Um, so, what's nice about a neural net like that is that you can interrogate it um, using uh, backpropagation. So, you can uh, you can ask, for instance, uh, what regions of a uh, of the input or the the structure that was presented to that model uh, made it. Uh, either a good or a bad model according, a, a good or a bad structure according to that model. So you, you can start asking what what parts of the, the structure give, uh, uh, let's say a bad or a good score, right? So the idea is coming from the field of image analysis. So there's this grad cam analysis method, um, which uh, I'm illustrating here using just the, the usual cat and dog example. So if, if you have a neural net that's trained to detect, uh, let's say, uh, various animals on, on, on an image. Um, and uh, you find that the model outputs uh, the word cat um, as a, an animal present in that image. Uh, this kind of analysis would allow you to figure out where exactly, what region of that image triggered cat as an answer. And uh, not completely surprisingly, you see that uh, this part of the image is, uh, is, is is what is responsible for, for the, the output cat. Um, now, uh, the output could have been different. So uh, if you repeat the same exercise, asking what part of the image is actually responsible for, uh, for the answered dog, then you would find this region also. So that's, that's, uh, that's a nice way to kind of use the, uh, uh, the, the information learned to un understand better uh, what exactly is happening inside that big black box. So we, we use the same um, idea um, for our model. So it's the same analysis done. And here what we ask is that, well, what regions of the structure were responsible for its bad uh, or good score? And um, so depending on the quality of the decoy we're fitting, we're, 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 uh, we're feeding our model, it will, uh, will highlight different regions that were deemed uh, uh, it's a detrimental to the score. And uh, interestingly, the native structure, which the model never saw before, is uh, appearing uniformly blue, meaning that there doesn't seem to be any region in the input that could be improved uh, uh, you know, in terms of score, which is a sign that we're, we're kind of uh, detecting the right native structure here. Right. Um, so so uh, moving on to protein-protein interactions. Um, um, so this is a more challenging problem, um, and I, it's been alluded to a few times. Uh, uh, main reason I would say, well, so the, the first reason being that there are there's less structural data to work with, um, so to train on. Second reason is that protein-protein interactions have um, uh, are much more evolvable and variable, so there's less of a coevolution signal that can be picked up. Um, and since most of these uh, AI methods uh, do rely a lot on coevolution to make the predictions. Um, it's not a surprise that the performance for, let's say, protein complex prediction is not as good. So, so here the idea is to to basically use another type of data source to to kind of improve the prediction. So, can we leverage the fact the the mere fact of interaction between two proteins to learn about the complex of the, the structure of that complex. So, so we know that we can learn the structure of a protein complex by training on known complex structures, right? So if you train on structures, you can learn structures. So we've published uh, uh, some work on that. Um, but the question is, can we learn to, 
can we train a model simply on the no, on the knowledge that two proteins interact or not? Okay. Um, so so uh, and uh, what I'll show here very briefly is just uh, our first attempt at answering that question using a simplified two dimensional model of protein protein interaction. So these are not real proteins; they're simply uh, uh, like a toy version of the problem. But I think you'll you'll get the idea and where we want to move with that. Um, so we built those data sets, uh, which we call Doc2D, and they're, um, they're very simple. They're just uh, shapes in two dimension that uh, look like your cartoon, let's say textbook cartoon representation of a protein. And um, so any two shapes we, uh, we generate using a, an energy function that is uh, known to us, but all unknown to the model that will We'll try to learn it. Uh, so we generate from that energy function an interaction that minimizes the energy. So you see here two shapes that um, end up assembling in that fashion um, because they minimize that energy function. The energy function is very straightforward. It's just uh, minimizing overlap between the shapes, but optimizing the contact surface between them. Okay. Um, so so uh, so two things we know we we know. Uh, when, when the pair of shapes interact, we know the interaction pose they form. So we know how to rotate and translate the two shapes relative to one another. We'll have the model predict that. Another type of information we know is just the mere fact of interactions. For any given pair of shapes, uh, we, we, uh, we generate a, a free energy, a binding free energy, and then uh, using a cutoff, we, we arbitrarily decide whether these are considered interacting or non-interacting shapes. Okay, um, so um, and uh, and this is based on on straightforward uh, statistical uh, mechanics uh, arguments. Um, so we're really talking about a free energy here for binding. Uh, the model is a neural net like that that will uh, that can work both uh, ways, meaning it can um, either predict the the pose of interaction uh, given two shapes, or it can give a yes or no type of answer whether those shapes interact at all. Um, and uh, what we see when we train uh, the model on, on the, that synthetic data is that it can learn um, the energy function either ways, uh, meaning uh, either using uh, structural data, uh, the interaction pose, or using what I would call functional data, the kind of data you have, uh, let's say, if you just know whether they bind or not. So so here's just um, a quick example of a, of a few um, a few shapes that were predicted by the model um, in terms of interaction pose. And then what, what you see being learned here, those learned features are, are essentially what you need to build the energy function. Now, the features learned are uh, very similar to the ones that we didn't tell the model, the true underlying features. So one is really just about the bulk and the other one's about the boundary of the surface or the surface of the shape. Um, so it, the, the model has effectively learned the energy function, uh, although it's never been presented by, by, uh, by any kind of structural, uh, with any kind of structural information. Okay, um, so, so just to wrap up in the last minute, I'll just like say, okay, so of course we're bringing these uh, experiments uh, to uh, real applications. So it's just that we, we like to start simple because there are lots of model architectures to try and it's easier to try them on light and simple data sets uh, before going to the actual PDB. Um, but, but definitely, uh, uh, you know, uh, where, where the field is going is to, uh, to generalize to more than proteins. So nucleic acids, small molecules and so on. Uh, have these models work on larger molecules. Uh, it's also going to be critical, larger assemblies um, and uh, moving towards uh, larger machines, basically. Uh, last point I'll make, I, I think is important, is that um, there's a lot of data out there that can be brought back in and help those machine learning models. So functional data, fact of interaction, proteomics, microscopy, and so on. Um, the PDB also uh, has a lot of, uh, is, is a, like surprisingly a, a resource that's not fully on, uh, that's not fully tapped because I'm, um, uh, the same way um, uh, we can learn a lot just from looking at, from learning at, about sequences. We can learn a lot by just looking at structures about motion and about function. Um, so machine learning models that can 
access uh, that information encoded in in all those uh, those protein structures uh, is is going to uh, be very helpful um, so with that i'll uh, stop here and uh, happy to answer any questions yeah. thank you very much guillaume that was uh, that was a great talk and uh, it shows the um, the breadth of potential applications of uh, machine learning uh, across uh, both fundamental and applied biological research.